The following is meant to be a comprehensive account of how the Boston Celtics have won no championship since 2008. I make this video because it is the most common criticism of the franchise. They've got the most titles in NBA history, you hear a lot of talk from the Big 3 team, yet a majority of their banners seem closer to the start of human life on Earth than recent times. So today I explore how that happened despite being so close and only spending one year truly rebuilding since that Celtics team. You'll have to forgive me, I lived every single moment of this in detail so the video came out a little longer than I expected. Therefore, if you enjoy it, please leave a like. The fully expected 2008 title came on the heels of the biggest regular season turnaround ever. 24 and 58 in 07 to 66 and 16 in the ring year. Phase 1 to the revival of the dynasty was complete, as the formula had now been proven. You could in fact immediately trade slash sign your way to a championship, which is a feat that you've surprisingly rarely seen since. In any case, as Coach Doc Rivers would later remark, to truly be one of the special Boston teams in history, you needed to win two at least. Which shouldn't have been a problem by the way. However, to say the signs weren't there early would be false. The signs that, despite the talent, this unit needed everything working in its favor when push came to shove, which would become a frustrating theme throughout the next 14 years. In 08, two unnecessary seven game series against inferior rosters, then a final series against the Lakers team missing Andrew Bynum. By far the most troublesome of the three being their battle with LeBron's Cavs, who were fresh off a finals run that deemed them one of the worst finals rosters ever. Boston was pushed to the brink of elimination by the squad, a what if I mull over to this day. Those type of struggles seem to suggest if the Celtics suffered just one major injury or even faced better, healthier competition, perhaps there'd be problems. Or maybe there wouldn't as the years piled up and the core became more and more familiar with each other. After all, it'd been the first go at it between a trio of stars who'd been first options the majority of the careers. Maybe this was the only year anyone would have a shot at beating them. Not a far-fetched theory, as the 2009 season rang and the green team was off to a 27-2 start by Christmas. Just for reference, the 73-9 Warriors were 28-1 by their Christmas Day game in 15. Ironically, the second loss was imprinted by the Los Angeles Lakers, who were bloodthirsty after the pounding they'd taken in Game 6 of the previous season's finals. The matchup displayed what everybody'd been thinking. This was the NBA Finals for at least a couple of more years. Celtics Lakers was going nowhere anytime soon. Well, except for literally this exact season. In late February, reigning defensive player of the year Kevin Garnett would go down with a non-contact knee injury just a few months before turning 32 years old. I bring up age only because it was probably the worst possible time a player with Garnett's circumstances could have had the injury. A big man who, at the point in time, was only a few years away from the start of his decline anyways. The injury would only prove to accelerate that timeline in the long term, while in the short, almost completely cooking the Celtics front line in one fell swoop. Sans Garnett, their consistently useful big bodies were down to Kendrick Perkins and Glenn Davis. Leon Poe would go on to tear his ACL in Game 2 of the first round thriller against Chicago, meanwhile they'd already lost a lot of their four depth in the summer of 08. So, about those warning signs from earlier? With no KG, the young seven-seeded Bulls with zero expectations despite the injury came within a hair of unseating the reigning champions, providing what could still be referred to as the greatest playoff series of all time. In reality, a first-round classic against a halfway decent unit shut all further hopes of a repeat down. The semifinals would present a better equipped upcoming Orlando Magic team headed by Dwight Howard who'd send them packing in 7. If not for the barely remembered Glenn Davis game winner in game 4, I doubt the series even gets that far. Even with the disappointing exit, the two best teams left in the East were this young Magic team nobody fully believed yet and LeBron's Cavs who still had not acquired a legitimate duo partner for him. Alas, Boston would re-enter the mix immediately so long as free agency was successful and Garnett came back healthy. Crossing one of those items off the list, Rasheed Wallace and Marquise Daniels would join the fold in the summer, bolstering some of the size and depth they sorely lacked in the front court. Unfortunately, the big ticket that rejoined was a far cry from the player that signed in 08. Still good, still an all-star, yet he moved gingerly. 
The ability to dominate offensively on a whim was gone. He wore this giant sleeve on his leg that looked as if he just left the hospital. Long story short, he could be good for an entire season and playoff run, but probably not great. And if the last two years had shown anything, he needed to be great. His health going forward being one concern, Paul Pierce would randomly undergo arthroscopic surgery in December to alleviate a random knee infection, which didn't end up being a huge deal, although it was scary with the team already operating on pins and needles. When it was said and done, Boston had managed only 50 wins, compared to their last two 60-win seasons. A beautiful example in numbers of the trend line happening with this squad. For much of the campaign, they appeared old, slow, and tired. Contrasted by the Cavs, who were flying up and down the court in the midst of another LeBron MVP year, and the Magic, whose roster looked even better than the one that just granted them an NBA Finals berth. With the 50 wins earning the Celtics a fourth spot in the East, media and fans alike gave up on them, opting for a second straight season of LeBron and Kobe matchup dreams. Of course, the plot got flipped on its head when Boston entered the playoffs and became very difficult to deal with for multiple games in a row. Sure, Garnett and the Vets were aging, but Rajon Rondo had entered the stage as a premier name, upping the ante from his days as a tag-along name to the Big Three. Carrying that energy into the playoffs, both Orlando and Cleveland fell in six, clearing the path to another Celtics-Lakers Finals as expected in 2009. The 2010 Finals became one of the fiercest of all time and a very worthy entry into the rivalry. Yet, reality had set in. With the Vets offensively running out of gas toward the end and Garnett being left out the drive between LA's towering big, when Kendrick Perkins went down with an ACL tear. Oh, so close to that coveted second. It just wasn't meant to be. Kobe Bryant would get this round marking sweet, sweet revenge. In summer 2007 at the introductory press conference, it would not have been unrealistic to expect a three-peat by the year 2010, with at least two championships being the bar. Headed into season four, one title had been produced with an increasingly small window for another out of this core. Rondo was entering the absolute peak of his game, although it remained unclear how effective he'd be once the big three were in rocking chairs. Desperate times calling for desperate measures, the Celtics would sign Shaquille O'Neal, who was fresh off of being paired with LeBron in an attempt to stop them. While it was clear he was no longer a main option on a title team, he could certainly be useful to a deep one. Jermaine O'Neal came along with Delonte West to join the fray, and the retooling reached its conclusion. Possibly the best starting five in the league. Size, wing depth, guard depth, star power. This team would want for nothing ever again. The front office saw to it that a scoreless stretch such as the one responsible for losing them game 7 would be highly unlikely going forward. Every action has a reaction though, and with two finals appearances in three seasons proving the formula had something to it, Pat Riley assembled a younger, better version of what the Celtics had done with the specific intent of replacing them. Miami was unable to replicate the depth in the first season, however, and opening night confirmed what many believed to be true. The original more season squad would be standing in the end. The original more season squad would not be standing in the end. While all on the floor together, the product was as magical as it appeared on paper. Who could have predicted that this would rarely ever be the case? Shaq, who was unironically a game changer when playing, was also quite literally on his last leg, only surviving for 37 outings before officially getting injured into retirement in the playoffs. While Garnett made it to 71 games, a December knee injury in Detroit served as a reminder his best days were behind him, and Celtic fans would forever be holding their breaths about his status and ability come playoff time. Delonte West snapped his wrist limiting him to 24 games, while Jermaine O'Neal's knee swelling held him to the same amount. So not only were Kendrick Perkins' placeholders not really placeholders at all, Danny Ainge traded him mid-season on the faith a hampered Shaquille O'Neal would be ready by playoff time. Shaq later revealed he told Danny not to do this. The idea was clearly twofold. Win a championship with the remaining bigs and newly acquired and add Christic holding down the five come playoff time, whilst getting younger at the wing with Jeff Green, holding on to the possibility of he and Rondo ringing in the next era of Celtic basketball once time was up with this group. It was a somewhat brilliant idea. Back in the real world, damn near everyone was hurt by the time their second round battle with the Heat hit the calendar, including Rondo who suffered a gruesome elbow dislocation in the middle of the series. A new era had dawned upon the East, as the Heat went on to figure out quite a bit about themselves in just one year with a much younger and sparrier Big 3. How could the Celtics respond in their ever-advancing age to finally get that second title? Um, they couldn't, to be brief. Well, but yeah, actually, they could've. There were two trades Danny Ainge came within a hair of making for the lockout shortened season. One came later on where a swap including Ray Allen and OJ Mayo would have occurred. Game changer? 
unlikely. It was just Ray was aging, his contract expiring, and the title window was very likely closed or slightly cracked open at best. The transaction would have granted more youth, potentially more on-ball creation, whilst putting him on the opposite wing of Jeff Green long term. More on him in a second, by the way. It wasn't the first time Allen had been dangled as trade bait, which was only part of the growing tension as free agency loomed. It was actually in addition to his alleged role in the potential Chris Paul trade before the 2012 season began. The infamous Lakers veto was not the only deal in the works, as a CP3 Rondo swap was very much in play, which does in fact raise to the level of game-changing deals. As great as Rondo was, he couldn't carry an offense. Defenses were very obliged to let his shooting go uncontested, and it very much felt as if the end of the Big 3 era would also expose him going forward. Apparently, Ray Allen agreed. With Kendrick Perkins reporting around a year ago, Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett were a no-go on the deal, wanting to keep Rondo around while Ray approved and pushed for it. The deal fell apart due to Paul's unwillingness to commit to the Celtics long term, but Ray Allen claims in his book that Doc Rivers nixed the deal because he did not want to do it to Monty Williams. As in, he didn't want to ruin his career by making him deal with Rashawn Rondo. Rondo's lore with Boston and Ray goes extremely deep, so much so that it deserves another video on top of the one that made many years ago. For the purposes of this flick, he's reported to have been a terrible teammate, claimed he carried the Vets to a title in 2008, and very much soured on Allen after they were nearly both dealt to the Suns for Amari Stoudemire around 2009 or 10. The two were said to have used boxing gloves to hash things out at a point, reported by Kendrick Perkins recently also. The relationship was so unsalvageable, in fact, it seems to account for more than half the reason Allen left for Miami the following summer. Ah, yes, let's address how it got there, by the way. No Chris Paul trade wasn't the worst of it for the 2011 offseason. Not only had the Jeff Green trade failed to yield a title in the short term, he now required heart surgery that would hold him out of the entire season. Even worse, at just age 25, he wondered if he'd ever be able to touch the court again. So if you're keeping track at home, Ray KG and Paul were now 34, 35, and 36 years old. Allen had been part of multiple trade rumors, including one Rondo thought he was being blamed for, which torpedoed their relations. The front office's efforts to win while getting younger with Jeff Green had just lost a year of testing at minimum, and their new supporting cast wasn't anywhere near enough to account for it all. Thus, the 2012 season went about as mediocre as anyone could have expected, eking out 39 wins in a 66-game season. For reference, every contending team that year either won 50 games or were much closer to it. Knowing this, the era of expectation for Boston's Big 3 was all but over, as even if they found some way to deal with Chicago's newfound contention led by D. Rose, they clearly stood no chance against Year 2 of the Heatles. Enter Plot Armor, for one of the rare times in recent memory they'd ever get it. During Round 1, Rose would tear his ACL, immediately removing the Bulls from any serious playoff basketball. Round 2 would bring an abdominal injury to Chris Bosh, holding him out for the foreseeable future and leaving Wade and James to compete with the roster that was built to support three stars, not two. Thus, Round 3 featured a battered but seasoned Celtics core against two-thirds of Miami's Yes We Did party attendees, resulting in a seven-game series nobody saw coming. Despite the best possible efforts from what was left of their soldiers, LeBron would once again topple his arch nemesis, sending them to yet another offseason full of mostly unanswerable questions. The first of which being, what were they to do with their disgruntled, aging shooting guard who was currently the greatest shooter of all time? Sure, he was no longer what they ordered in the 08. The party was clearly over without him, however. That much was clear. After many attempts to trade him, Rondo reportedly telling him he only had 11 games left as his teammate on the plane when Ray tried to patch things up, and the staff relegating him to the bench and building the offense around Rondo, which he saw as rewarding bad behavior, the decision really was not a hard one. That decision got even even easier once Danny Ainge signed Jason Terry while simultaneously offering him less money than he asked for. The party was, in fact, over. After five years, two finals, and one title, the sharpshooter would spurn Boston for the team that just beaten them twice in a row, effectively blocking their second title. Rivals, if you will. If for some reason they did have a great summer and retooled the roster successfully, there was now a below zero chance they'd ever touch the heat in any case. They did not have a great summer, and Jeff Green returned as a mere promising role player who delusional fans held out hope could be the number two to Rondo in the coming years replacing Paul Pierce. Perhaps there was some hope a combo of Jason Terry and Avery Bradley could replace an older Rays production well enough for them to get their foot in the door for contention once again come April. That hope died when Jason Terry got dunked on it. Oh, wait, no, sorry. 
That hope died when Rajon Rondo suffered a torn ACL at the end of January, which would not only thoroughly cook their 2013 hopes, but potentially bleed into the start of the 2014 campaign. Fully accepting these circumstances, once New York dashed their comeback hopes in the first round, rebuild time had finally arrived. The era would officially end with a single title to show for, which was a disappointment by virtually any standard set that day in the land before time. In late June of 2013, Ainge officially hit the button he'd been rumored to have been considering for some time now. The question had always been when, and not if, pieces or all of the core would be traded. It was a tight-knit group, loyalty just did not supersede the future in his eyes. So wheeling and dealing, Boston would receive a haul of inconsequential players in the present along with unprotected first rounders for a 2014, 16, and 18 in exchange for Pierce, KG, and Jason Terry. Brooklyn would be able to contend immediately as new ownership was keen on making a splash, while the Celtics would get time to see what they had with Rondo and Jeff Green while also having picks and space as insurance if it went nowhere. It went nowhere. Rajon Rondo without attack dogs on the roster wasn't terrible. He still got off a near double-double average after returning in January. He also wasn't a piece strong enough to warrant waiting to build around, rather than cashing him out for other pieces outright. 82 games of first option Jeff Green revealed he was not a first option. He acknowledged as much at the end of the season telling reporters he quote, couldn't do it alone, and that he didn't know how to handle being the go-to guy, specifically citing preferring jumpers as opposed to trying to get to the rim due to the level of defensive attention he was now receiving. If you knew anything of what Boston fans expected from Green the day he arrived in 2011, eventual rim pressure and on-ball creation with the help of his athleticism was absolutely the dream years down the road. He's shown flashes of it in OKC, yet between his heart surgery and the now live samples, it was clear this was as good as it was going to get. With only one pick in the 2013 draft, Ainge would trade up to Dallas acquiring Kelly Olenek. In case you're wondering where some of our heads were at during the summer, there was a Celtics blog post asking why he couldn't become the next Dirk, comparisons the legend himself had to shoot down a few years later. Okay, so 2014 sucked as expected. However, as a Celtics fan, I can say I feel as if it's the only rebuild season I've ever lived through. Low key, it very much is. They've made the playoffs every single season since, and for good reason too. With pick six in the 2014 draft, Boston would select Marcus Smart, who wasn't that far removed from pushing a fan in the stands, which I thought would end up being a far bigger deal. I'll go on in hindsight to say it displayed his passion. After 22 games averaging 8 points on 40%, Rondo and Dwight Powell, by the way, were shipped to Dallas for Jameer Nelson, Jay Crowder, Brandon Wright, a 2015 first and a 2016 second pick. This ran the total up to eight draft picks over the next four years. Parting ways with a supposed top PG and the final remaining piece of the 2008 title team, the rebuild was officially in full throttle. Not before getting rid of Jeff Green, of course. Both sides knowing he'd never be what they hoped, the front office cashed him out for a draft pick as well, while obtaining Tayshaun Prince and Austin Rivers in return, both of whom they quickly swap away for players and a second round pick. No one could quite say for sure when Beantown would be relevant again, except for the loudest, smallest person in the room. In the final minutes of the 2015 trade deadline, Ainge finessed a deal with the Suns acquiring offensive mini guard Isaiah Thomas for Marcus Thornton and a 2016 first. IT had been managing 15 points a game on a team also employing Goran Dragic and Eric Bledsoe, one of the weirdest, semi-successful units I can remember. Joining a conglomerate of decent players, Boston would scrounge together a near 500 record to sneak back into the playoffs for a first round bout with, once again, LeBron James. Only back with Cleveland now. A quick and predictable sweep ensued, yet there was something to be said about a squad that took only one year of downtime to amass both picks and a roster talented enough to avoid tanking even for a small time. Clearly something special was looming. 2016 was a fairly unremarkable season in the story, outside of two notables. At pick 16, they would luck into Terry Rozier, who would matter much sooner than later. Then, despite the roster not changing a bunch, the Celtics would amass a 48-win record that was tied for third best in the East, behind a much-improved year under Isaiah Thomas, who'd become a first-time All-Star, averaging 22 points and 6 assists. I can't say for sure whether anyone ever had a 5-9 guard down for All-Star and best player on a team throughout the future, so the fact that it was happening was amazing, because the best hadn't even come yet. 
ousted by the Hawks in the first round, it'd be the last time they weren't a major figure in the East for years to come. Once again, only two seasons after ridding themselves of Pierce and Garnett. By the way, the chickens from that trade had officially come home to roost, as with the third overall pick in the 2016 draft, Jalen Brown was chosen to don the green, one of eight players they selected that year. Not only did he add more wing depth, with his draft position, the obvious hope was for him to become the official shooting guard of the future, as while Avery Bradley had done well in his years there, he was no franchise piece. Speaking of one of those, the IT story was encouraging. Was he capable of being the element to restore a franchise to glory though? Small, defensive liability, probably a cap on how well he could do offensively in the coming years. There needed to be more, right? So just like everyone else that summer, Boston threw their caps into the Kevin Durant sweepstakes even after having acquired Al Horford in free agency. For the time being, two all-stars decorated the roster, along with decent role players and recent picks with potential to become stars or dangerous pieces. Throwing Durant into this mix would officially bring back championship expectations, likely making it one of the shortest rebuilds on record. Unfortunately for them and the league at large, not only would Durant not help with these ambitions, he'd flat out make them impossible by signing with the Golden State Warriors, the 73-9 team. Now for the time being, almost regardless of what these Celtics or anyone else did, winning a title was out of the question for as long as he wore that jersey. Of course, this did not stop business as usual or future aspirations. The mark would move to 53 wins and Isaiah Thomas was now putting up nearly 30 points a game on good efficiency while having his name mentioned in MVP conversations. Regardless of if anyone had ever foreseen an all-star, there's no one who was claiming future MVP mentions. Marcus Smart's role had grown with the overall team production suggesting they'd moved into the one piece away territory. That theory was serious battle tested in the first round when they were so very clearly about to lose to the Bulls led by Rondo, Wade, and Jimmy Butler. In one more plot armor twist, Rondo would go down with injury and they'd complete the reverse sweep after having lost both home games, which had been a huge disappointment. Regardless, they survived a thriller against the Wizards, which became Kelly Olynyk's greatest moment as a Celtic in Game 7 then predictably be stamped out by the Cavs in the conference finals, adding another LeBron loss to the total. The loss itself was not the important part, surprisingly. It was well known that if you weren't the Cavs, Warriors, or Spurs, you could pretty much forget realistically emerging from your conference, and you could definitely forget winning a title as an Eastern team if you did somehow defeat Cleveland. Worse for everyone involved was IT's hip injury, which caused him to miss the rest of the series after game two. What appeared to just be a bump that caused swelling and irritating was later found to be an event which essentially ruined his career. In a season where he'd made the contractual expectations clear by stating the front office would quote, have to back up the Brinks truck, it seriously could not have been worse timing. An Isaiah-less Celtics team, however, would set them back years, given he was statistically the best scoring punch they'd had since prime Paul Pierce. Still, tying up future alter money and a small guard who now sustained a potentially significant injury would have been a uh, decision. Telling him he was okay to play despite the growing concerns over his hip was also a decision, one Thomas still blames to this day for how his careers turned out. In any case, as mentioned earlier, loyalty was never to come before the future under Danny Ainge, meaning the first chance he got, he found an upgrade. Kyrie Irving Somehow during an era where it seemed he, LeBron, and Love could get to the finals in the East at will, he was now asking for a trade, presenting the perfect opportunity for Boston to strike. Shortly after selecting Jason Tatum with another third overall pick, then signing all-star Gordon Hayward through free agency, they'd send Thomas, Jay Crowder, Ante Zizic, and Brooklyn's 2018 first rounder to Cleveland in exchange for Kyrie Irving. I could not believe this trade actually happened. All in one summer, a roster that could conceivably contend morphed into a potential clear favorite in the conference to reach the finals, even if beating Golden State was still out of the question. Regardless, 2018 would be the first season including any real expectations since around 2011 or 12, which counted as a fantastically quick turnaround considering they only missed one season of competitive basketball at all. Now, a goddamn disaster. Mere months after signing a four-year, $130 million deal, Hayward suffered one of NBA history's gruesomest injuries minutes into the first game of the season. It was over. First option Kyrie, Al Horford, and a host of unproven young guys was not what the front office paid for, and certainly not enough to get where they wanted in year one. As far as fans were concerned, expectations were postponed with only a hope of Hayward being able to remain the player worth the money he received, a scenario that proved many times more pessimistic than the actual product. 
The Celtics under Kyrie would go on a long winning streak nobody remembers as both Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum stepped right into the leftover shots Hayward would have consumed. Terry Rozier was all too excited to take whatever leftovers he could find for himself and the depth was evident. Good thing too, because in what would become a theme throughout his career, Irving would randomly disappear, this time through knee troubles that required surgery late enough to scratch him from that year's playoffs. It had to be over now, right? Both star acquisitions done for the season, mostly young pieces left over. This was a first round out at best. Except the 55 wins they'd managed, even with all the issues, should have signaled what was coming. The Jays both averaged 17 a game through the remainder of the campaign without Irving and entered the playoffs situated at the second seed. Surviving a seven game series with Giannis, who was seen as the heir apparent in the East, then absolutely blasting the Sixers in round two, who were also thought to be furiously ringing in a new era, Boston was poised for their first finals appearance since the start of the decade, only needing to get through LeBron to do it. <laughs> only. It seems simple enough given the 2018 Cavs turned out to be a train wreck, with James now manning his worst roster since 07. It was not simple. Although it'd been well understood a healthy Celtics team was likely to make quick work of Cleveland, LeBron put up one of his best performances ever, laced with championship experience to overcome an 0-2 deficit and win Game 7 on their home floor, the fifth time he'd eliminate them since being thwarted on his way to the finals in 2010. There didn't feel like a ton to do in the 2019 offseason, but pray given the state of the roster. Over the recent years, drafting had gone great, signing had gone great, on-court development was where it needed to be. What was left besides just being there to play ball? Well, for one, maybe there just wouldn't be enough of them. Brown, Tatum, and Rozier all became accustomed to their roles in 18, which brought them to the doorstep of an NBA Finals berth quite far ahead of schedule. Initially, the prospect of throwing Irving and Hayward back onto a roster with so much success seemed fail-proof. Rather, it turned out being most of the problem. Nothing but smiles filled the garden to begin with. Kyrie sat mid-court, serenading the crowd with reassurance of his imminent re-signing plans. After all, the Thomas trade seemed like a steal when the risk was the time associated with it. If nothing significant transpired in two years, they could lose Irving with zero return. At the time of the signing, this was the doomsday scenario with nobody knowing what Tatum and Brown could become. Doomsday approached quickly with their first sub-50 win season since 2016 via a roster that was thought to have 60 win potential. 2019 for the Celtics was a season plagued by bad losses, terrifyingly non-committal comments by Kyrie Irving waiting and hoping for Hayward to regain star form, waiting and hoping for the Celtics to reach theirs. None of the above would ever materialize, culminating in a rematch with the now contending Bucks where you could just see Kyrie waiting for the clock to hit zero with his departure in mind. Anyone who couldn't see he was gone after the all-star tunnel video with Kevin Durant was simply in denial. Too many coincidences had piled on by that point. If one good thing at all had come from this year, it was the random drafting of Robert Williams at pick 27 before the season. They were gonna need him. After World B Flat predictably did the dash, a scenario that once seemed dire turned out not that bad at all. In his place, their second tiny point guard in three years, acquiring Kimball Walker in a deal involving Terry Rozier. Fresh off of a 25 point per game season, perhaps his playstyle and personality could be less invasive than what Irving brought to the table with similar scoring. Perhaps he would also start dealing with consistent knee troubles for the first time in his career. In a complete shock move, which ended up making little sense, Al Horford would opt out of his contract to sign a four-year deal with Philly, leaving center minutes mostly split between Daniel Tice and Ennis Kanter. Fortunately, the wing duo were continuing to take strides, while Hayward recovered to an acceptable level. Marcus Smart by this time had claimed his title as heart and soul of the team. Meanwhile, another draft blessing was realized through Grant Williams at pick 22. The 2020 Celtics were back to the halfway point of contention, despite the summer 2017 plot having failed. Maybe the roster was good enough to get to the finals now, though it was probably still a piece or two and some core development away from really being expected. A season shut down right in the thick of things didn't necessarily help, as COVID stopped all plans in their tracks, returning months later in a bubble environment which still draws the ire of many today. 43 wins to 21 losses at the shutdown suggest another 50-win season was on its way, potentially becoming the third in five years. Regardless, Disney basketball gave the vibe that anything could happen, so rolling the ball out to settle matters was necessary. Smacking the Ben Simmons Sixers was no problem once again, the reigning champion Raptors lost their bite without Kawhi, yet it's 
still took a ridiculous Game 7 to get the job done, landing the Celtics in their third conference finals in four seasons. An amazing sounding feat, 2020 was still the first time there'd been a real chance that if they happened to advance, winning was a real possibility. Not a likely one, just far likelier than any series involving Golden State. Ironically, Boston was racing back to the top at the exact same time a rival from the past was in Miami, who through draft and free agency had fully recovered from the LeBron James era. A six game battle ensued, with the Heat now going 3-0 against them in playoff series since 2011, once again directly dashing their hopes of an NBA Finals berth. That's the point where it feels the questions about Celtics success began to arise. When exactly were they going back to the finals? When exactly were they going to win another one? The Big Three delivered their only title since the 80s, which wound up feeling underwhelming, and the rebuild from that core was currently 12 years removed, with not a single finals appearance to show for after three third round appearances. I think the problem was 2017 and 2018 were runs that happened a good bit before anyone actually expected anything from them, seeing how one roster wasn't respected and the other was injured. Regardless, slander territory had been entered, and Kevin Durant's Warriors disappeared into thin air, so any contending roster was no longer receiving grace for their lack of banners. 2021 proved to be an even weirder year than the previous. No fans in the original stadiums, pumped in crowd sounds, all types of COVID replacement players for uncomfortably long stretches. Beginning in December, as bubble basketball wrapped up in October, each organization just had to thug it out. The last man standing in July would be crowned champion. Despite Tatum and Brown both taking leaps, officially becoming all-stars together for the first time, Kimba's knee issues would worsen, jerking him in and out of the lineup while mostly rendering him useless and unavailable for the playoffs. Refusing to stop there, Jalen Brown took a ligament in his wrist, snatching him from the rest of the season and playoffs. Gordon Hayward's efficient 18 points a game via recovery lost to the Hornets in free agency with no actual replacement. Long story short, Boston employed a total of 21 players throughout the injury riddled 72 game season, rolling into the playoffs on two and a half wheels to face Brooklyn's newly minted Big Three. Atomic Bomb vs. Coughing Baby would be an accurate description. Being quickly and predictably disposed of, Boston had suffered its first early playoff exit since 20. 16. Where to now? In a surprise move, Brad Stevens would supplant Danny Ainge as executive, hiring Ime Yudoka to replace him as coach. His first move in the front office? Riding a wrong by sending the declining Kimball Walker to OKC to bring back Al Horford, who'd mostly just been lost in randomness since leaving in 2019. The Wings had progressed enough to cover the on-ball creation mostly. The paint, however, had been sweet basically for the past two seasons. With him and recent draft pick Robert Williams taking over, the Celtics were onto something special in the near future. A few more details needed to be sorted. Details such as what to do about the 500 start they were off to by January. Using any measure, the situation was looking dire. Brown and Tatum were in year four of their partnership and fresh off of an injury riddled first round exit, presently appearing to be a bottom feeding East team. How much time was left after coming so close so many times? Had they peaked too early? Would Stevens be forced to trade Jalen Brown sooner than later as a massive extension loom? With a record of 26 and 25 on January 31st, Brown tweeted, quote, the energy is about to shift. The energy did indeed shift. An eight-game win streak would follow, along with a trade bringing in Derek White for Josh Richardson, Romeo Langford, a 2022 first-round pick, and a 2028 first-round pick swap. The game was set. Brad Stevens had finally completed the secret formula. Two all-star wings, a defensive menace in Marcus Smart, another ball-handling defensive pesk in Derek White, a defensive big man combo allowing Rob Williams to roam off non-shooters as Horford held down the paint, and a couple of more bench pieces. Of course, following typical Celtic luck through the recent years, William would require knee surgery. He'd be permitted for a return in the playoffs, yet as a big man relying almost exclusively on his athleticism, the flag was extremely red. In any case, 51-31 became the finishing record, losing merely five games after Brown sent his tweet in January. Marcus Smart took home Defensive Player of the Year, with Williams also qualifying as a candidate. They were so back. Brooklyn's super team scheme had fallen apart, leading them to be swept in the opening round. Chris Middleton began his journey of injuries, missing the second, just barely cracking the door enough for Boston to advance to yet another playoff bout with the Heat. Through a very weird seven game series, they'd emerge victorious after narrowly avoiding the craziest last minute meltdown in history. The Jimmy Butler attempt still evokes nightmares today. 
Thus, Boston had done the deed. 14 years removed from its last title, 12 years removed from the last finals, and 4 years since fans began to bring back expectations, a single finals berth had been granted. Unfortunately, despite having lost KD, Golden State had gone nowhere, with 2022 being their first season of health since the 2019 finals. Picking up where they left off, the entire core was out with something to prove, but especially Steph, who'd constantly been having the validity of his three rings question. The Celtics would feel the full force of this, despite having a golden opportunity to take a 3-1 lead on the home turf. They should have taken a 3-1 lead on the home turf. There was simply no real answer to defending Curry with either of their big men on the court. Jason Tatum put up a full-on stinker whilst being clamped down by Andrew Wiggins, and Draymond Green would later go on to reveal that a whole game plan involved sending Jalen Brown left, the second best player on a championship hopeful team being challenged by a grade school rule. Despite the improbable midseason turnaround, preparation had failed to meet the situation as Golden State celebrated a title on their home floor after six. One championship in 36 years. No championships since 2008, and that was a super team. Three conference finals and an NBA finals since 2017. When were they going to win one? Good news was it at least seemed close. The roster was clearly adequate. Ime Udoka had worked miracles. Time and maturation seemed to be what was left on the checklist after the many meltdown occurrences. Ime Udoka. Suspended. Yeah, he violated multiple team policies on top of the cardinal sin, stepping out on the along. Regardless of how it happened or why, Boston's championship level coach was exiled after just one season, leaving players and the fan base alike totally blindsided. It was the very last situation this specific unit needed. In his place, Joe Mazzulla, an existing part of the coaching staff, so not technically as terrible as it could have been. Still an unwelcome disruption with the time potentially ticking on a title window. Alleviating those worries was a midsummer trade sending five players in a pick to Indiana for Malcolm Brogdon. The ball handling concern simply had to be addressed with a steady hand serving as a very welcome sight. There wasn't a single element missing from the team outside of composure and maybe, possibly, sorta kinda, Yudoka. They would finish with nearly 60 wins, luckily somehow only netting them the second seed in the East. Tatum had become a flat out superstar averaging 30 points a game with Jalen Brown not far behind at 26. Robert Williams' check engine light remained flashing however, appearing in only 35 total games. Lack of shooting on his part was limiting enough, only sparingly being able to provide his defensive role was sure to be a death sentence for the Bigs tenure in Boston at some point. Atlanta taking this team 6 was the first warning sign. In no way were they a terrible team, there was also just no reason for the 7th game scare to nearly materialize. Boston avoided it, then Philly was on the schedule once again, who at this point just had no mental edge in what was supposed to be a robbery after 3 meetings in recent years. To be fair, it was very nearly lights out after 7 grueling matches, including game 1 where James Harden willed the squad to an improbable win without Embiid. It was the second warning sign. Their spirit was very clearly broken after Game 6 though, as Embiid once said, quote, they always kick our ass. Jason Tatum's heroics in Game 6 and 7 suggested a corner may have been turned finally, which provided much momentum headed into their third conference finals against Miami in four years. Well, that was the thought process. Reality brought forth the nastiest, most disrespectful 3-0 lead against a contending team maybe ever. Yet another meltdown, this time to a 7 seed fans had no faith in a little over a month ago. In short hindsight, I do believe had they gone on to be swept, we'd not be looking at the same Celtic team today. Being their fifth deep run with no cigar was one thing. Getting brutally swept by a rival you've beaten one time since 2010? The front office would just have to have some pride most likely. Not only would there be no sweep though, Boston recovered to very nearly pull off the greatest comeback ever. Graphics were being made, Celtics fans were nearly celebrating. Regardless of the result, Derek White's game winner will live on in history. I don't believe I'll see a better overall game anytime soon. Despite the valiant effort, the Tatum and Brown led Celtics failed once again after so much fanfare, so many expectations, yet only one NBA Finals appearance to show for. 
Perception of the group became so embarrassing, in fact, the league watched on in laughter as Brad Stevens was forced to fork over $300 million to Brown, a star who seemed to exhibit similar limitations as the year before. Tatum's extension will arrive this summer, locking in a small fortune between the two whilst rendering the future supporting cast questionable. Speaking of which, recently Stevens decided to toss the kitchen sink at it. Marcus Smart could have conceivably been a Celtic lifer. How could you possibly justify running it all the way back though? His value to the team also converted to value on the market, enabling a deal to bring in Kristaps Porzingis quietly emerging from one of his top seasons in the association. Rob Will had an incredible role in these contending units. Minutes restrictions and long stretches out of the lineup had also clearly contributed to their last few eliminations. Steven sent him, along with an unhappy Malcolm Brogdon, to the Gulag for Drew Holiday who'd recently been abandoned by the team he'd literally just expressed the intent to play with forever. And so, there are your 2024 Boston Celtics. 15 years removed from 2008 and many 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 eons removed from the dynasty before that. The big three Celtics have marked themselves possibly the most off-putting title team ever to fans. Paul Pierce continues to hate on LeBron openly in the media. Their long-standing treatment of Ray Allen endears the group to nobody outside of Boston. KG isn't even that far removed from claiming the squad broke LeBron, and a new quote about their ring seems to hit the web every year. The reaction this evokes is predictable. Fans feel the super team's ring is being milked, then it draws a spotlight over their recent history. Sure, you've got the most titles of any franchise ever, but boy, there sure is a lack of anything recent given how much hype they're constantly receiving. Then a conversation happens about all the banners the franchise has and when they were won. In short, they are a lightning rod. At the time of this recording, Boston dons a 16-5 record, once again regularly being referred to as the best team in the league by opponents. Expectations? Check. Talent? Check. Only time will tell if it all comes together. But for the purposes of this video, in a nutshell, this has been how the Boston Celtics have won exactly one title since Larry Bird Celtics, and no titles despite the hoopla since the master plan on a sunny day in the mid-2000s. 